Um, so something that, I don't know why, it's, it's just come up several, several times this week in my, in my thought. And um, you guys, some of you guys that have been around here for a while might remember. I think it was, it was when, it might have been when Pastor was going through his cancer journey. Um, it was, you know, a real difficult time. And uh, he told the story about the one day when he was he was in his office and he was studying. Now, I've never met anybody who can study like Pastor Ed. I mean, that guy studied. <laughs> he studied and studied. I, I don't think there's anybody alive that can outstudy that man. And he was in a real dark time and he was just studying and studying, just trying to find something. And I remember he said something to the effect of, I was just trying to find God again. And he's just pouring through the scriptures in his office and he's studying, going through scriptures and pulling all the different books down and trying to find different things. And finally he just started crying and he buried his head in the Bible and he heard God say, Ed, just be with me. I'm more than enough. And I remember when he when he preached that out, that really uh, stuck with me. And I can't tell you the whole message, I can't tell you the whole series of it, but that phrase, just be with me, I'm more than enough, has stuck with me a lot to the point where I remember that as that being me. And I go, no, 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 I wasn't, that didn't happen to me. But it became so integral in my understanding of who God is that that became a part of my story. And I got to keep reminding myself, no, that was that Pastor Ed heard that, and the only time I, only time that's ever popped in my head was because of that story. Um, but part of that thing that that makes this something is is recognizing that God doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense at all. And we spend so much time, not maybe all of us, but theologians and scholars and pastors, spend so much time trying to make sense out of something that will just never make sense. So why do we keep trying to make it make sense? Why can't we just accept the fact that it doesn't make sense? And we keep changing things, and we keep coming up with new theories, and we keep trying to extrapolate new information from Scripture to try to make God make sense. God will always be bigger than any box we try to fit Him in, so why do we keep trying to fit Him in the boxes? That wasn't me, that was Richard Rohr. So today will be three places, Colossians, Galatians, and Corinthians. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through the faith and the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Yet God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands. This is set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Now, this first phrase here, you know, I don't want to spend a lot of time there, but it says, See to it that no one takes you captive by empty philosophy, or by philosophy empty to see it according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world. Now, I know that I am in the minority. Um, I'm not alone 
in the country or in the world believing this, but I know I'm definitely in the minority, believing that most modern evangelical Christianity is empty, empty to seek philosophy according to human traditions. And I have, you know, sources and materials and facts to support that position when you look at human history and time. And we think about how many people here were really upset when they found out that I don't believe people burn in hell for all of eternity when they die. But that's a human tradition. That's new, right? That's not, that's not found in Christ. That's, that's, that's something that we added later on. We recognize that we needed to fear people into changing their life instead of loving them into changing their life. And so we have so many of these things. Baptism, you know, do I need to be water baptized or not baptized? Do I need to be dipped or dunked or sprinkled? Do I, do I need to speak in tongues? Do I need, all of that is according to human tradition. And so we, we get all tangled up in trying to figure out the right human traditions we need to follow, the right things we need to believe that we're being tossed here and there by all these human philosophies and, and this empty deceit. Now, according to some YouTube videos that have been made, I recognize that there are people who believe that I am the one leading people astray into deception in human traditions, right? My, 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 I don't longer care about proving them right or proving me right or proving them wrong or proving me wrong. Believe what you want to believe. It's not my argument anymore. I just want to find out how I can just be with him because he's more than enough. We sit there and we pour over these scriptures, we pour over these scriptures, and, and we, we see these things time and time and time again, right? This, this passage right here in verse 14, it says, uh, we'll start verse 13, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us. See, as human beings, we have this debt. And, and our sin has incurred this debt. And this debt needs to be paid in order for God's wrath to be justified, right? This sounds like stuff that I normally preach, right? And so until our debt is clear, God will always be angry with us. According to this one verse, it's the only verse in all the Scripture that says this. Oh, crap, he's going to the Greek. Because guess what? It doesn't actually say that. Furthermore, though you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcised state of your flesh, God made you alive together with Him. He kindly forgave us all our trespasses and blotted out the handwritten document against us. Wait, what? I thought there was a certificate of debt. Handwritten document. Those aren't the same thing. So what is Paul saying here when he actually wrote this letter in Greek? He's saying that God canceled out the law. The law was in our way. Because what happened was, many, many, many years ago, God said, guys, you guys, you guys, you guys can't follow the law. We said, we can follow the law. He says, you, you can't follow the law. No, well, we can follow the law. No, you can't follow the law. No, I promise, we can follow the law. You can't follow the law. No, 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 we can follow the law. Okay, fine, here's the law. And guess what happened? We couldn't follow it. Imagine that we were right, God, or we were wrong, God was right. Imagine that. So now, as the Apostle Paul says in, later, in other places, the law became a stumbling block. It became a stumbling block. What did it become a stumbling block for? Because we thought we can earn our righteousness. We can just be good enough to earn God's favor. And God said, okay, fine. If you want to attempt it, here. 677 laws. Try to follow them all. And if you violate one, you violate all of them. You either keep the whole thing or you violate the whole thing. Right? Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. We couldn't even do the first ten. You couldn't even do the first ten, let alone the other 660. By like, one of them, you violate the whole thing. We couldn't even stop touching the pig of the skin for Sunday morning. We love our football. And there's that one law that says you don't touch the skin of a pig. But every Sunday we get on and watch football because they're full. Ah, maybe. Either way, at one point in time it was. The law was violated. 
So what is he saying here? He's not saying that, that, that we have this debt that needs to be paid. He's saying you had this decree that you guys wanted. It's been a stumbling block for you because you keep thinking that you need to earn something in order to be in relationship with me. Just be with me. More than enough. You don't need to earn it. Just be with me. But the problem was, is that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It, what makes sense to us as human beings, what makes sense is that I have this debt because I'm a terrible sinner. I'm worthless and I'm depraved and I've done terrible things and therefore that needs to be dealt with. Because that makes sense to me because that's what I've been taught and it's been, you know, it's been indoctrinated into me by the world and the church and every, my school and everything. You do something bad, you get punished. You make a mistake, there's a punishment, right? And not all punishment is as severe. Like, you, you make a mistake on the test, your punishment is you get the answer wrong. You don't get a good score, right? You get a lower score than if you got the answer right. So I mean, we're not like whipping people, but there, you make a mistake, you pay a cost, Right? Some, some are more severe than others. We, this has been in, indoctrinated in us in every facet of our life. That, that's why it makes sense. And so once again, we're not trying to deceive people by making one verse out of, out of context. Because once again, this ransom theory that has been ransom theory then became into penal substitutionary atonement, which we're not going to talk about penal substitution. I'm done talking about penal substitutionary atonement and that nonsense. But all of those things, ransom theory and penal substitutionary atonement, both of them are based on this one verse of Scripture that was changed. And was it changed to fit our, our, our belief system? Or was our belief system changed because this was changed? And once again, I don't believe the translators were intentionally trying to deceive us. They're trying to make this make sense. And the way it was written doesn't make sense. Instead of us allowing ourselves to be made in the image of God, we have constantly tried to make God in the image of us. We try to make Him fit what we think He is. And what we want God to be is we want God to make sense. We want A to B to C to D. And guess what? Sometimes God goes from A to Z. And he goes from Z to F. And F to H. Does it, it, no, I don't know. I'm getting confused now. Now I'm going to actually say a letter that comes after a letter. And you're like, well, that, that is the way it's supposed to be. God goes all over. He doesn't go in our order. He doesn't make sense. He doesn't follow our patterns. You can't draw an algorithm to explain God's movement. It doesn't make sense. God doesn't make sense. Galatians chapter 2, verse 15. Paul talking to some Jews. He says, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law no one will be justified. Right? So you can't, once again, go back to the, the, to the Colossians passage. We can't fulfill the law. The law is a stumbling block against us. Therefore, God has removed the law, the handwritten document. He has removed it. And he's nailed it to the cross. The law is over. The law is done. Don't longer try to be justified by the law. You can't do it. I told you you couldn't do it way back then, and you argued with me. Right? Here we have Paul saying this again. Now all he's saying, now all you gotta do is have faith in Christ. And if you have faith in Christ and you believe in Christ Jesus, then you're gonna be justified by your faith in Christ. It says it right here, plain as day. But guess what? It doesn't actually say that. We changed it because the way it was written doesn't make sense. Talked about this several weeks ago. It doesn't say faith in Christ. It says faith of Christ. Have it right here. But me being saved by Christ's faith in me doesn't make sense. How can that be? I can't even fathom how God has faith in me. But it says, and this is why this is one of the reasons why. This kind of started, and, and like I said, my friend Joe helped me understand it, because it doesn't... Why does he say faith in Christ, faith in Christ, faith in Christ three times? He doesn't. 
He says, it's the faith of Christ, and because of Christ's faith in me, I believe in him. And I'm justified by his belief in me. So I'll reread. Yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed... Oh, I'm sorry. And yet we know a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith of Christ. So then we also believed in Christ. So he believes in us, and then we also believe in him in order to be justified by the faith of Christ. So he believes in us, and therefore we also believe in him, and therefore we are justified by his faith in us. Not my faith in him, we're justified by his faith in us. Once again... Pastor Ed told, told the story, sitting there, head in the Bible. God, just show me you're real. Prove to me you exist. Ed, just be with me. I'm more than enough. Ed's faith in Christ was shaken. Ed's faith in God was shaken. It wasn't as Christ's faith in Him. Anytime I've gone through a difficult time, my faith in God gets questioned. His faith in me never gets questioned faith in you is never in question. Your faith in him might be, but not his faith in you. It doesn't make sense. So we have to try to make it make sense. But God doesn't make sense. God doesn't make sense. But, but what we do is we spend all of our time trying to know and trying to figure out and trying to, to make it make sense. We pour over the scriptures. We pour over systematic theologies. We pour over and we study and we study and we study and we study and we study, and we study trying to find the answers, trying to make it all. And we <coughs> create these giant webs of, well, this verse here, and then this verse here, and then this verse here, and then this verse here. And if you put all of these verses out of context, out of character that weren't written to each other, and, and, and you put all these together like a giant jigsaw puzzle, well, that's what now God fits in my box. And then God's going to show up one day and God's going to take your box and he's going to throw it on the ground and destroy it. Because he says, not because he's angry at you for building the box, because he's really uncomfortable trying to fit in the box. Stop trying to make me fit in there. I don't want to fit in there. Smash it. Ha! Now you can't put me in your box anymore. And some of us... When that happens, we get really angry. And guess what we do? We get on the ground and we scoop up all the pieces and we glue them all back together and we construct the box exactly the way it was before. Some of us say, oh, well, maybe I just need to rebuild the box and build it a little bit bigger. And then we build up a little bit bigger box. And then he smashes that one. And eventually we get to a point where we say, you know what? I'm not building boxes anymore. I'm just going to accept the fact that it doesn't make sense. I don't need it to make sense. I can cease striving and just know that He is God. He's going to be exalted. I'm not. I don't need to know the answers. I just need to be with Him because He's more than enough. First Corinthians chapter 8, we talked about this a few weeks ago as well. If anyone imagines that he knows anything, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Now, the verse before that is, um, Knowledge makes arrogant, knowledge puffeth up, but love builds up. Anyone who supposes that he knows anything does not yet know as he ought to know. If anyone loves God, he is known by God. Very clear. We need to stop trying to know what can't be known. We need to stop trying to figure out what can't be figured out. We need to stop trying to make sense of something that it will just never make sense. Now, God is not trying to... He's not saying, I'm, I'm not going to make sense because He wants us to be confused. He's not, trying to, he, he's not trying to not make sense because He wants us to... You know, to... to, to, to um, confuse us or deceive us in any way. He's just so massive. His love is so great. His grace is so powerful that we can't, we're not able to comprehend it. And he's told us that from the very beginning. Kate wanted to go back to the beginning. From the very beginning, he said, you can't get it. I am so massive. I am so huge. I love you so much. You'll never understand me. You'll never get it all. 
And I don't expect you to. All I expect from you is to love me. Because if you love me, then you're known by me. It's right here. Anybody who supposedly knows anything does not yet know as he ought to know, but anyone who loves God is known by him. The objective is to know, to be known, not to know. Talked last week, Galatians chapter 4. Now that you've come to know, or rather, be known by God. The objective is not to know. The objective is to be known. And God cannot be known, not because He's some angry, distant Father who's way off there. He can't be known because He doesn't make sense. His love for us doesn't make sense. The fact that I am saved by His faith in me doesn't make sense. The fact that I don't have to earn anything, that I don't have to deserve anything, that I don't have to work for anything, that I just get all of it no matter what doesn't make sense. Because we're told our entire life, if you want something, you got to earn it. You want money, you got to work for it. Right? We don't like participation trophies because what are we telling people with participation trophies? You can just show up and get the same thing everybody else gets. Well, guess what God's been telling us all along? Just show up, you're going to get the same thing everybody else gets. That's the way it works with God. We all get the participation trophy. Whether we earn it, we work for it or not, we get it. And once again, my son's in T-ball and everybody, everybody gets a trophy and we don't keep scoring, it drives me crazy. We're not setting kids up for failure. We're not setting up kids success this way. Not everybody does get a job, right? Not everybody does get a degree. Life isn't that way in the world. Now, in the kingdom of God, that's the way things work. But in the real world, there's winners and there's losers. Mm, you mean we're not keeping score. Give me the other day. This is, I mean, off the tee, in the air, out of the infield. Home run. He has one base. It's one base. He only has one base. Well, no, he, Jimmy. No, no. <laughs> Why couldn't they get a home run? Because the rules are stupid. Um, <laughs> but it's not the way it works with God. It's not the way it works with God. We all deserve. We all belong. We all get that thing. We spend so much of our time working externally, trying to make sense of something that will never make sense. We spend so much of our time externally looking for something that we already have. Why are you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my Father's house? Recognize we already have what we're looking for. We've had it all along. Christ in us, the hope of glory. We look outside. We want to be validated out here. We want to be successful out here. We want to be loved out here. We want to, we want to have all the knowledge out here. Not recognizing we already have everything in here. He says it time and time and time again. Did you not know that you are God's temple? Did you not know, or why do you look for me? Did you not know that I must be in my Father's house? We need to stop trying to make sense of things that just don't make sense. And it's okay that it doesn't make sense. We don't need to know. We need to be known. And then I come up here, and I try to give a sermon that makes sense. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Why do we need everything to make sense? Why do we have this desire to have all of the pieces of the puzzle fit neatly and tightly together? Why can't we just be okay just saying, well, I don't know how it works. I don't care. I'm just going to be with God because He's more than enough. I'm just going to show up in my life. I'm going to show up and be present in the moment with whoever it is I'm with because it's more than enough. I don't need to be right. I don't need to be wrong. I just need to be. 
and to be who God created me to be. I don't even know who that is. I don't really need to figure it out. I just need to be. I need to stop looking for him when I already know that he's in his father's house. And I am his father's house. We need to learn how to be okay with the fact that God doesn't make sense. And no matter what we do, no matter how hard we study, no matter how much Greek we know, no matter how much Hebrew we know, no matter how many Bible verses we have we have memorized, no matter how many systematic theology books we've read, God still doesn't make sense. And he never will. And it's okay. Because I'm known by him, I'm loved by him, and I love him. And he is in me. And he's been there the whole time.